All right, so uh, let me begin by saying that uh, I expect to return your papers to you. Well, in fact, I'm absolutely certain I'll return your papers to you uh, a week from today, uh, next, uh, next Tuesday. Uh, now, uh, I've been discussing with you the rebellion of 1857-58, and in my concluding remarks last week, uh, I had been talking to you about the policies of annexation uh, pursued by uh, Dalhousie, Governor General Dalhousie, and uh, in particular, the last thing that I talked to you about was the doctrine of paramountcy, and you recall what, that the example that I've given to you uh, was a case of uh, Avadh. Uh, and Avadh, uh, if you look over here in the map, uh, you'll see it says Avadh there, but Avadh is uh, referring here to the district. Uh, the press, for those of you who have been to India or have some familiarity with modern day India, the, the modern city of Lucknow. Uh, which is in the Gangetic Plains over there, where, where it says Avad, in fact, right, right at that place. Uh, that's, that's a place that we're really talking about when we speak of uh, Avad in 1857. Uh, so uh, uh, in 1856, uh, the British had annexed Avad, and they did so on the grounds. Is it coming through? The yeah, yeah, I was getting some static, though. I think it might be hitting me first. Um, okay. I don't know if this is going to be any better, but is, is there still some static that you can? Or? It's not bad. Okay, all right, yeah. So, so in 1856, uh, uh, Avad had been annexed, and it had been annexed on the grounds that the ruler of Avad, Vajid Ali Shah, was neglecting his subjects. Um, you recall that what the British had did, had done uh, in, in the native states, that they had posted a man who was called the resident. Right? And the resident is, is the person who, in fact, actually, because these are all places where the British had what they called a subsidiary alliance uh, with the native ruler. Uh, and, and of course, they had a subsidiary alliance with the ruler of Avad, uh, the last ruler being Vajid Ali Shah. Uh, and the resident uh, files a report. And one of the things that the resident points out is that, and I think that this is, in fact, the last thing I'd mentioned to you, that the, that the uh, Nawab, uh, the, Nawab is the ruler, uh, that the Nawab, in fact, actually spends virtually the entire day amusing himself with such things as kite flying, uh, going to see cockfights, uh, amusing himself with his harem, so forth and so on. Right? And so because he's neglected his subjects, therefore the British argued that these are grounds uh, for them to, in fact, annex uh, the state. Right? Now, if you think about it, if you think of a modern-day policy, I mean, obviously, uh, it would be a difficult for a state, a modern day state, to annex a place on those grounds, although very often it does become the grounds for occupation. I mean, in some respects, that is, you might say, precisely what the United States did in Iraq uh, after the war when they imposed a kind of an occupation, right? Um, uh, and and uh, I, I'm, what I'm trying to suggest to you here is that this, this doctrine of paramountcy simply meant that the British viewed themselves as the paramount or the principal power and therefore arrogated to themselves certain kinds of rights. Right? And the other grounds on which this annexation took place, uh, I'm just reiterating what I would mentioned last time just to bring us up to date, uh, is the doctrine of lapse. And the doctrine of lapse, you recall, was uh, something which, in the, which said that if a uh, a ruler of a native state did not produce a biological heir to the throne, a male biological heir to the throne, that state would cease to exist. It would lapse, right? It would be absorbed into the territories of British India. So here you have, a, you have an official called Sir John Hobhouse writing in 1853. Uh, I have a very strong opinion, this is with respect to one of these native states, that on the death of the present prince without a son, I'm quoting, no adoption should be permitted, and this petty principality should be merged in the British Empire." End quote. And so in 1848, the state of Satara, in 1850, the state of Bhagat, which is in the Punjab, 1852, the state of Udaipur, which is modern-day Rajasthan, uh, 1853, Jhansi, which is in central India, and 1854, Nagpur, also in central India, and finally, 1856, Avad. These are six illustrations of states that are, in fact, actually going to be now annexed. All right? 
into the territories of British India. So now let's go back to the larger picture. The larger picture is we're trying to understand what in fact generated the rebellion of 1857. Right, so uh, what we've talked about is the increasing racial sentiment uh, and divide, the policies of annexation, uh, offenses caused to the religious sentiments of Indians. Uh, it's something that I've mentioned to you repeatedly that, that initially for a long time, at least for 50 years after company rule was established, uh, Christian missionaries were not permitted in the country to proselytize, but these rules began to be relaxed in 1813, 1833. By 1833, when you have the next charter renewal, uh, Christ Christian missionary activity is really in full swing. Uh, and of course, what you find is in 1829, 1830, the abolition of sati, uh, which, was, uh, which is the subject that we'll take up when we look at the question of gender. Uh, and this, uh, the abolition of sati certainly offended some uh, uh, people. But we're talking about the religious sentiments of a large number of Indians, whether they were in fact Hindus or Muslims. Uh, th uh, that were hurt uh, on, uh, uh, as a consequence of certain British policies. Uh, because the supposition here is that religion is in fact very dear to these people. It's very dear to these people, so if in fact you actually do something that offends their religious sentiments, it's likely to provoke a uh, reaction. And that's, uh, ha it has been argued that that was one of the principal reasons for the rebellion of 1857. Uh, British expansionist policies creating hardships. Uh, you should take that in tandem with the next point, the severe economic collapse, uh, the deindustrialization of the country. When we look at the economic data, what we're going to find uh, that as late as 1750, as late as 1800, in fact, India still occupied a significant portion of the world economy. Uh, Angus Madison, a Cambridge economist, whose figures we're going to look at in slightly greater detail later on, uh, he had argued that if you look at the world economy in 1750, right, there were three major players, three major players, China, India, and Europe taken as a whole. Right? So China, China accounts for roughly 30, 32% of the global economy in 1750. Europe accounts for about the same. And India accounts for about 25%. Right? The three together, put together, account for 90% of the world's economy, 1750. And 1914, right, more than 150 years later, India accounted for 1.4% of the world's global economy. 1.4%, precipitous decline that you're going to see. Now this is, this, of course, here we are talking about the 1850s when the decline is already in evidence. It's already in evidence. You know, what was India's manufacturing capacity? Uh, why was there such an extensive amount of migration of people? Right? Which is a subject I've already spoken to you about. Indentured labor migration, famines. I mean, British rule is bookended by famines. It begins, recall, right, with the Great Bengal Famine in the 17, late 1760s. Uh, and we're going to see that famines are going to be a recurrent problem. Right? So forth and so on. So th these are signs of severe economic collapse, but the expansionist policies are, create, uh, are related to that, but they're also creating a drain on the revenue. And when they create a drain on the revenue, what that means is that, of course, what the British are attempt, going to attempt to do is they're going to try to extract more revenue. When you try to extract more revenue, you're going to be putting pressure on the landlords and the peasants. So what we're really speaking about is a considerable amount of agrarian distress, unrest in the countryside. Now, there's a long history of agrarian distress. It didn't begin with the British. You know, in, in all societies, there's always been a certain amount of agrarian distress because generally you'll find that that's where the pressure is going to be applied by the elites, particularly for such things as extraction of revenue. Right? Uh, but, it's, but in this case, we're also talking about other ramifications, again, all of which we have hinted at. We haven't looked at them systematically, such as the fact that there's going to be a shift to a shift that is not complete at this point, but it's already taking place, a shift to the market economy. And when I say a shift to the market economy as opposed to the cottage economy or the handicrafts economy, what that means is that lots of farmers are no longer growing food for themselves 
and for the community, they're actually growing it for the market. They're growing it for the market, for a global market. So you're going to find the shift from, from foods that are sustenance fruits, right? to cash crops, to cash crops. And this is where obviously things like indigo, opium, cotton, all of these start to become exceedingly important. Right? So it's, it's a constellation of these factors that we're really speaking about when you're looking at expansionist policies, economic decline, ag agrarian distress, you know, what's happening in the countryside, migration, this is a constellation of factors. And then if you go further down, General Service and Enlistment Act, 1856, just a year past, just a year before the rebellion. What did the German General Service and Enlistment uh, Act do? What it is was it required the sepoys, the sepoys are the soldiers, right, working in the armies of the East India Company. And remember that we're talking about three big armies of the company. There's a Bengal army, there's the Bombay army, and there's the Madras army. And as I mentioned to you in my previous lecture, and as you can see from this slide yet again, right, you see that in fact the deep south and in fact the west coast are not affected by the rebellion because the rebellion broke out fundamentally in the Bengal army. Right? And there's a very sophisticated theory which, which uh, I'm not really going to sp spell out in considerable detail. It's, it's actually a theory raised by an American scholar writing in the 1920s. He sort of went into obscurity, but was then revived in the 1950s, a man called Buckler, uh, where he said that, in fact, when we say mutiny, we are, in fact, using a highly misleading term because when we say that the sepoys mutinied, it suggests that British rule was legitimate to begin with, that you know, you mutiny, uh, uh, you're a soldier. In fact, it was the British who were mutinying, he's, he argues. It's a very sophisticated theory because all the way until the 1850s, the British continued officially, officially, to recognize the Mughal emperor as the sovereign of India in many ways, right? Uh, and and this, is, this, is, this is something that goes back to the time of Clive when I described the whole argument about the shadow government, which is that Clive had made an argument that, well, effectively we're going to be rulers, but it's much more beneficial to us if it appears that in fact the Mughal emperor is still on the throne and that he's actually ruling. Right? This, this, because this is something that will endear us to the Indian public, to the Indian masses, if they think that uh, the Mughal emperor is still sitting at his throne and he's actually ruling, we should continue to give that appearance. And so one of the things that's going to happen throughout the 1770s all the way until the 1840s, until early 1850s, uh, is that the British are going to confer gifts on the Mughal emperor. Okay? And these gifts are a, of, overtly a sign of their obeisance a sign of the fact that they accept the, Brit the Mughal emperor as the sovereign. Right? But this is all at the official level. So, you know, who's mutinying is a very interesting question if you, if you take a look at this particular theory that Buckler has. But as I said, that's a fairly sophisticated kind of theory. What's of interest to us here is that if you go back to the General Service and Enlistment Act 1856, What's of interest to us is precisely the fact that in the Bengal army, when this act was passed, it meant that the sepoys would now be obligated to serve wherever the company instructed them to, which, which could mean in Aden, in the Gulf states, for example. Now, some of these people were coming from orthodox families. Right? And, and in these orthodox families, uh, you did not travel, you did not cross the oceans, you get polluted if you do so. Right? Just as an illustration. And of course, serving overseas entailed hardship, separation from the family, right? and then usually you would get an allowance, but one of the things that was done, is, and that's why in parentheses it says the extra allowance, that's the allowance that was given to those soldiers who were going to serve uh, in the British Empire, uh, you know, uphold the cause of the British Empire overseas, uh, this extra allowance that used to be given was going to be abolished in, by this act of 1856. Uh, and these, these soldiers would now be serving in places like Sindh, Afghanistan, Burma, and of course beyond. 
And fundamentally, to get to the last of these, and, and, and this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. Uh, what it does give you, it gives you a fairly good idea of the range of causes uh, that we can think about for the 1857-58 rebellion. But to get to the last of these, and this is really quite evident from everything that I've said thus far, uh, but I just want to reiterate this and actually quote something from um, uh, an Indian writer, a prominent Indian uh, writer uh, of that time, and uh, this is what he said. Uh, he's referring to the total exclusion of Indians from the governance, from the governance of their own countries. That Indians did not play a role in ruling themselves, not even in mid-level positions. The high, top hierarchy was, of course, completely British, right? Uh, and the Indian Civil Service exam, in fact, could not be taken by Indians at this juncture in 1856, 1857. Uh, it's going to be a couple of decades later that Indians are going to be able to sit for the Indian Civil Service exam, right, which enables them to join the bureaucracy. But in order to sit for that exam, they had to actually take the exam in London. Uh, and, and that's going to take several more decades before they're able to actually take the exam in India itself. But at this juncture, Indians played absolutely no role in the governance of their own country. And this is what Sir Saeed Ahmad Khan, uh, a major, um, major uh, Indian uh, uh, think Muslim thinker of uh, the 19th century, has to say. I believe that there was but one primary cause of the rebellion, and I'm quoting him, the other is being merely incidental and arising out of it. Nor is his opinion either imaginary or conjectural. It is borne out by the views entertained by wise men of past ages, and all writers on the principles of government agree in it. It has been universally allowed that the admittance of a people to a share in the government, to a share in the government under which they live, is necessary to its efficiency, prosperity, and permanence. That if you're going to have a government, right, which is going to display characteristics of efficiency, prosperity, and permanence, then the people whom this government is ruling should be allowed a share in that government. Moreover, the natives of India, without perhaps a single exception, blame the government for having deprived them of their position and dignity and for keeping them down, right? so forth and so on. Right? So this is, this is what he's referring to, the exclusion of Indians from the governance of their own country. All right. So these are the causes of the rebellion. Now, what was the nature of the rebellion? You know, how far did it spread? Uh, what might be some of the incidents that we might want to think about when we're thinking of the rebellion? So this here, let me show you some slides, and I'm going to then uh, discuss a few episodes uh, which I think are important, uh, and some of uh, some of the implications will be addressed both today and in my following lecture, uh, because of course the implications are going to be are going to be extremely consequential in view of the fact that the company will really be effectively abolished, uh, and India will now become uh, a crown colony. Uh, if you turn to this slide over here, General Orders of the Excellency of His Commander in Chief, Headquarters Shimla. Notice, by the way, Shimla, that's, that's the summer capital, right? That's the summer capital, the hill station that I mentioned to you. Uh, 18th April, 1857, uh, how, did, how, did, uh, how and when did the rebellion break out? So you actually have uh, an Indian sepoy. His name is Mangal Pandey. It's mentioned here. Let me get my pointer. I can uh, indicate to you exactly. OK, so if you look over here, Mangal Pandey here, the, right? Mangal Pandey Sepoy, number 1446, 5th Company of the Native Regiment in uh, Infantry, guilty of both charges. So what did, what did Mangal Pandey do? Remember these cartridges? Uh, and they had put uh, beef fat and pork fat. Uh, so Mangal Pandey is actually going to, in a place called Barakpur. And Barakpur in March of 1857, uh, he is going to, so it, there's a little description over here, right? what he's going to do is he's going to basically lead a, a revolt. He's going to lead a revolt. He's going to be, he's going to be, he's going to be captured very soon, uh, and he's going to be hung a couple of weeks later. Uh, but that's the first breakout of this revolt within the ranks of the Bengal army of the East India Company. Uh, and then in May of that year, in May of that year, 
uh, there is going to be a larger revolt in Meerut. Meerut is roughly around 100 kilometers from Delhi. Uh, so again, we're speaking about North India here. Uh, and what the mutineers are going to do, or the rebels are going to do, is they're going to, in fact, uh, slaughter a few English officials there, because these are large numbers of Indians who have now re revolted, and they're going to march to Delhi. Now we have to pause for a second and think about Delhi. Right? And, and some of what I'm going to say is going to take us to the 20th century as well. The capital of British India at this point in time and had been for some decades was Calcutta, right? Eastern India. Right? So turn your attention if, over here. So we're talking about this is Bengal over here. This is Bengal over here. And this is Delhi over here. Right? Historically, Delhi had been exceedingly important in India and in India's history. Right? Many, of the, many of the cities that you hear about today, the huge metropolises in India, you know, 15, 20 million, uh, that includes Delhi, it includes obviously, you know, Calcutta over here, and you, this is not a full map here, but, you know, Bombay over here, and then further down here, Madras. I mean, these. Right? and others such as Bangalore and so on. Uh, many of these, Bombay over here, Calcutta, Madras down in, in the south, these are developed during British times. Delhi has a history which is much antecedent to that. The Mughal emperors had established themselves. It was not the only place where they had established themselves. They had also established themselves in Agra, all right, over here. They had established themselves in Agra. They had built another capital for a very short period of time. Akbar had in Fatehpur Sikri. But, uh, but uh, Delhi had been historically important. And one of the things you have to try to attempt to understand is the symbolic nature of power. So if you want to, in fact, actually indicate to the masses that you have now inherited the role that the Mughals had, what you have to do is you have to be able to take possession of Delhi, right? because Delhi was historically the seat of empires. And it was a seat of empires even before the Mughals. There used to be the Delhi Sultanate. And under a different name, Delhi was known by a different name before. Uh, it is, it, its name appears in the epics, right? and the Mahabharata, for example. Uh, so uh, what we're suggesting here is that the rebels themselves are in fact cognizant of this. They are aware of the, the importance of Delhi. Why do they march to Delhi? Partly because of its historic importance, but more explicitly because the last Mughal emperor, and this is where we go back to Buckler, that the Mughal emperor is still sitting there. It's not that the Mughal crown has disappeared. I mean, you haven't heard much of the Mughal emperor in the last 50 years preceding this. But the Mughal emperor is still sitting there, you know, right? The Mughal emperor is sitting in Delhi. You know, of course, at one point, his empire had extended to all of North India down to the south 150 years ago. Now he's largely confined to the Red Fort, a fort built by one of his predecessors, Shah Jahan. Right? He's largely confined to that, but he's still the titular ruler of India. And he's called the king of Delhi very often. And there's an extraordinarily fascinating story about him. But the key thing for our purposes is they march to Delhi. Now, Bahadur Shah Zafar, the last Mughal emperor, is essentially senile at this time. I mean, he's approaching 80. He doesn't have his wits about him entirely. Not entirely. But again, we have a complicated picture because some of what I'm saying here is a kind of a stereotype from British texts. And I'm doing it deliberately as a provocation. That's how he was viewed. The rebels certainly view him as the repository of authority, the legitimate source of authority. So what do they ask? They, take, they go to the Mughal Emperor Bahadur Shah Zafar and say, will you lead the revolt? And he agrees. And there's, a, there's going to be a controversy about whether he agreed or whether he was cajoled into agreeing. I mean, if you've got, you know, 50 angry young men uh, with weapons shouting into your ear, will you lead the revolt? Well, uh, you, and, and, you know, you're about 80 and you are not in completely in possession of your wits. 
uh, uh, which was the case with him, apparently, well, was he in a position to understand exactly what was going on? You know, did he think that this was going to be a revival of the Mughal throne? Well, we don't really know what he thought exactly, but he agreed to lead the revolt. He agreed to lead the revolt. And what's going to happen very soon thereafter is that the rebels, along with Bahadur Shah Zafar, so because once he decides that he's going to take over the rebellion, you're going to find that the rebellion is going to grow in scope considerably. And Delhi is going to be sieged by the rebels. It, right? So now the British are going to have to reoccupy, retake Delhi. They lose Delhi, in other words. They lose control of Delhi. They're going to lose control of a number of places. Uh, and one of, the, one of the places that's going to be extremely, this is Lucknow. That's Avad. So you can, uh, over here, okay? And, and when you see O-U-D-H, that was the other way Avad was spelled, A-W-A-D-H. This is the other, other spelling. So this is a map of northern India, mutiny, 1857 to 59, right? Uh, and in the city of Lucknow, the British have a building called the Residency. It's called the Residency for the obvious reason that that's where the resident used to stay. Before the annexation, they had the resident. Right? After 1856, of course, it is now part of British India, right? It is part of British India. A little footnote. Uh, just a little footnote, the Nawab of Awad is going to flee to Calcutta. And he's a man of great, he's a great connoisseur of music, of drama, of theater, right? And one of the reasons why Indian classical music in the 19th century is going to develop here, okay, in Calcutta, is because the court of Awad, when Wajid Ali Shah flees, the court flees with him. His courtiers, some of the nobles, they flee. And that is why Indian classical music, North Indian classical music, uh, begins to develop here in Calcutta. I mean, you know, that's the connection. For those of you who know anything about Indian classical music and why many of the great musicians came from this part of the country. All right. Um, we'll return to Vajid Ali Shah in a moment because in many ways he's like Bahadur Shah Zafar, the Mughal emperor. And I'm going to suggest what is one of the fundamental questions at stake here. I don't believe that any of the histories that you would read would actually dramatize what I'm saying it in this particular way. They wouldn't provide this kind of analytical frame, but I'll suggest to you why that is going to be important. Before we do that, let's just finish up with what's happening in Lucknow, just for a moment, just so that you get to see. So in Lucknow, in, in Delhi, the British have been driven out, right? In Lucknow, they're going to all gather together in the residency, a very large complex. They're going to all gather together there, and they're going to try to protect it from the rebels who are trying to infiltrate and take over the residency. So that's called the siege of Lucknow, the siege of Lucknow, right? And there is a man called uh, uh, Havelock. It, it, and, and you'll see why I'm mentioning it, because it'll give you a sense of how important this whole thing became in the British imagination. Right? Now, Havelock is a general who's going to help break the siege of Lucknow. So he becomes a glorified hero. Yes? Can you spell Lucknow? Lucknow, yeah. Sure. L-U-C-K-N-O-W. Okay. okay? So he's going to help break the siege of Lucknow. All right? And he's going to become this enormous hero in the British imagination. Now, how big a hero you can gauge by going to London today? Because if you go to Trafalgar Square, I hope some of you know the meaning of Trafalgar Square, right? That this is, this is where Nelson's column is. Right? So it's, it's one of the central tourist sites. Um, loads of pigeons, that's what people go to, you know, right? Uh, dropping their shit on all of these statues. Uh, now, there is a statue. So, you know, you put the great heroes in Trafalgar Square. And that's what Nelson's column is. It celebrates the victory, of course, at Waterloo, right? Uh, and on the side, in that square, there's a statue of a man called Havelock. Right? 
And in the, around 1900, 50 years after this, Havelock had been completely forgotten. A man wrote a pamphlet called Who and What is Havelock? Right? He wrote this pamphlet because the people who were coming and you know, tourists, Britishers from other parts of the British Isles, and even Londoners, many of them said, well, why is this man you know, celebrated in this central spot where you have a memorial to Lord Nelson? Right? I mean, this is where the greatest military heroes of the country are going to, be, are going to reside. Why Havelock? So Havelock had been forgotten, but in 1857, 1858, he was far from being forgotten because he is the man who lifted the siege. Right? He's remembered there at Trafalgar Square. This is also a little, little sign of how it is that you, you might want to read statues, why, we, why certain statues are important and then in fact actually lose their signification. All right? So now Lucknow, Wajid Ali Shah has been deposed, 1856. Muslim ruler, but he is a Shia. That's a, another interesting complication. Uh, the, the Mughal emperor is a Sunni. Okay, he's, that's Bahadur Shah Zafar. Both of them were poets. Poets. So what is the narrative that I'm giving you here? The narrative I'm giving you is this. That in many respects, this was an encounter between two civilizations. It's not simply, you can't simply view it as a bunch of rebels and there's this outbreak, okay, there's a mutiny, right? So there's a standard historical narrative and I've given you the standard historical narrative. These are the causes of the rebellion, right? And that's what you're going to read because that's typically how one understands it. But what is at stake here is something quite different I want to suggest to you. Vajid Ali Shah, the complaint that the resident has against him. The complaint that, among other things, is going to justify the annexation eventually, right? Is that this man is, as I pointed out to you, someone who neglects his subjects. He spends too much time writing poetry, flying kites, going to cockfights, amusing himself, drinking, engaging in debauchery, right? Now, perhaps he did some of that. It's not clear to me, by the way, that all of that is necessarily incompatible with the arts of governance. It's not clear. You know, uh, I mean, the modern day equivalent is you see the president plays, you know, five rounds of golf every week, right? Uh, you know, that, that, is that governance? We could ask, right? I mean, think of it, right? But what is the critical question here? The critical question here is that Wajid Ali Shah was actually a man who was extremely learned and who represented a very cosmopolitan civilization. He was fluent in half a dozen languages and wrote fluently in several languages. Wrote fluently. You know, very few people actually write fluently in several languages. There are people who know 8, 10, 12 languages. Uh, but he wrote, in, and he wrote in, in a wide array of genres. Now, his British competitors, if I may put it this way, are rather pedestrian. I mean, somebody like Dalhousie, yes, I mean, he's, he's learned, you know, and he can write English well, but that's all that he can. Whereas Wajid Ali Shah is a man who, in fact, does all kinds of things that the British found completely weird. For example, gender-bending roles. So he plays the role. He would, he would stage a Hindu play, and the British couldn't understand why a Muslim ruler was staging a Hindu play, right? He stages a Hindu play, and he plays the role of Radha. Radha is the consort of Krishna. So he takes on a, the role of a female, right? From a great Hindu mythic story. And the British found this absolutely absurd, you know. But it was something that Vajid Ali Shah thought was in fact very much part of the cultural ethos. What this is, is really a story of a kind of a British provincialism encountering an Indian cosmopolitanism which they did not recognize as such. They simply thought that this man was basically engaging in debauchery. You know. And Badr Shah Zafar himself was a man. The emperor now was also similarly much like Vajid Ali Shah. I mean, I'm not saying the two are alike, but he himself was a man who 
was an accomplished poet. Today he is considered to be one of the finer poets in the Urdu language of the 19th century. You know. Right? So, you know, from the British point of view, these are separate domains. You know, there's a domain of politics and then there's a domain of literature. Right? There's a domain of materiality and then there's a domain of what you might call the cultural domain. And these two don't really mix. But this was not really how an Indian ruler such as Radhi Jali Shah or Bahadur Shah Zafar actually operated. So I think that there's this, there, there is this fundamental uh, disjuncture between the British worldview and the Indian worldview. And I think this was very much at the heart of the rebellion of 1857. All right? And just to give you a sense of how, I'm going to show you some of these images. I'm going to show you some. I'm going to circulate. These are all originals from, from the 1850s, part of my collection over here. Uh, these kinds of prints circulated widely, widely in Britain. I mean, they sold by the thousands very often. Okay? And so what you have here is this is the relief of Lucknow by General Havelock. So I've already indicated to you who Havelock is. Uh, this is a print. I'm going to just pass them around. You can just take a look. Uh, uh, this is the mutinous sepoys dividing the spoil. All right? uh, this is the blowing up of Kashmiri Gate at Delhi. Now, I want, to, I, want to, I want to dwell on what the British did in Delhi in just a moment. Go back to the importance of Delhi. All right? uh, and this is... Uh, these uh, three correspondents looking at the sacking of the Kaiser Bagh. The sacking of the Kaiser Bagh is, you know, when, when the, the, initially when the rebels take it over, they loot, they loot, they engage in some loot. Right? Um, fugitive sepoys crossing the river. So these are sepoys who are fleeing the British troops who, have, who are, in fact, actually in pursuit of them. Uh, this is a very dramatic one. Fugitive officers with their families concealing themselves in the jungle. Okay, so you know the idea being here that the, that the rebels had created a regime of terror in a way, right? So you, you've got these English families and English women with their children. They have to flee. They have to seek hiding. Uh, all right, uh, and finally the massacre of English officers and their wives. Uh, I, I, when you look at it uh, very closely, you'll see that the, the, these prints are very fine prints, by the way. Uh, but you'll see the kind of dramatic effect uh, that the person is, in fact, attempting to create uh, through this. All right. Now, a couple of episodes, which I think are important. All right. Delhi. Let's go back to the question of Delhi. When the British... So, Bahadur Shah Zafar, the rebels, they have managed to occupy Delhi. The, there's going to be a bitter fight by the British to repossess Delhi. They're going to use cannon, of course. They're going to use cannon to try to blow, blow apart the, uh, the ramparts, They're to uh, try to get the rebels out uh, from the places where they had taken refuge. Uh, and eventually, the British are going to be able to recapture Delhi. Now, when they recapture Delhi, the first thing they do, the first thing, I want you to think about it. I'm going to ask you if you can reflect on what, why you think they did this. They go into the Red Fort. The Red Fort is where the Mughal Emperor's headquarters are. Right? That's, where he's, that's where he sits. They go into the Red Fort and they drink wine and eat pork on those premises. What does that mean? Why would they do that? You, they drink wine and eat pork. And where do we get this information from? We get this from the first official history written of the Sepoy mutiny by British officer. Okay, by a British officer. Yes. Yeah. They are. So you're on the dot. Absolutely. But how, how would you interpret it? That's kind of like a, like a middle finger to Google. To the OK. So, so shall we say an 
a deliberate humiliation. A deliberate humiliation that what you do is that because there is a taboo on the consumption of wine and on the consumption of pork, you do exactly the two things at a site that is in fact actually holy to the Muslims. Remember that, remember that in Islam, uh, in principle, there is no distinction between temporal and sacred power. That is material and spiritual power, right? Uh, and of course, the Red Fort had a mosque as well. It had a mosque, which was a private mosque where the Mughal emperor worshipped. Uh, uh, but they, so they go into it. So as has been mentioned, absolutely accurately. Uh, I'm going to put it in a slightly different language. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh no 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 no! These were these were going to be Indian soldiers too, but they're but they're Britishers as well. But they're Britishers as well. Remember that all the artillery, the cavalry, and of course, uh, uh, the, the officers who are leading the infantry, they are all British. But there were still Indian soldiers. Oh, the Indian soldiers as well. Yeah, but you see, the the, the you, you, one of the things you have to remember here is that it's it's not only necessarily the British soldiers who might be engaging in this conduct. It might be, for example, Hindu sepoys right in the service of the company in the service of the company as well right and this is this is mentioned to us by KM Mallison which is the first large official history that we have uh, of the sepoy mutiny that what did so let me put it in different terms now uh, right what they do is they desacralize the place right the, the place that was that was sacred is in fact desacralized. It, it, its sacred importance is completely eviscerated. Or if you want to put it in yet another language, they re-territorialize the Red Fort, right? That this is the territory of the Mughal Emperor. We now are commanding it and we in fact take it under our possession. That's to re-territorialize it. There are different ways, by the way, in which you re-territorialize a place. I mean, this is a this uh, with this is a strategy that is very often undertaken, not just by conquerors, but it's undertaken by modern nation states as well. Uh, I mean, the illustration that I would give you, just so that you understand what I mean by re-territorialization, uh, is the manner in which China has re-territorialized Tibet. Tibet, right? So what what have they done? That over a period of several decades, they have changed the ethnic composition of Tibet by bringing in mainlanders, the Han Chinese, into Tibet where, so that the Tibetans themselves become a minority in their own land. Right? That's a form of re-territorialization. This is a different form of re-territorialization -terri which involves a kind of a desacralization of that territory. Right? And, and it's, it's absolutely dramatic if it's intended to create a dramatic effect because what it does is it, in plain English, they pollute the Red Fort and the territory of the Mughal Emperor. Right? That's what they do by eating pork and drinking wine on the premises. And what they are doing by that, of course, is by, the, by displaying their power of doing so, they are signifying the importance that they have and the power that they have. Right? Now the Mughal emperor himself is going to be captured. He's going to be captured. And what are the British going to do? And this, and this is exceedingly important because this is the difference between a, a colonial power that understands the rhetorical importance of law and order and a purely despotic state. So if somebody said that the British were in fact actually a despotic state, I might have some disagreement with that view. Because what a despot would do, what a totalitarian regime would do, in an instance like this is they capture the Mughal emperor and they shoot him dead. Right? They just shoot him dead. No, they didn't do that. They put him on trial. They put him on trial. We said, we'll have a trial. We'll have a trial and he's going to be tried on grounds of treason. Now it's very complicated because treason against whom? The company. But technically he's the ruler. 
technically he's the Mughal emperor. Right? So it's, it's, so, and of course you know what the outcome of the trial is. You can, you can say that a trial is only a fair trial when there is a possibility, however remote, that there can be more than one outcome. It's like the show trials that the Soviets used to have. Okay, this, under Stalin, you know, they would have these thousands of show trials, political prisoners, and so you have a trial, you know that all of them, all of them are going to be found guilty and are going to be sent to Siberia, unless they're, of course, just murdered later on. Right? Now, it's, you, if you were to put it in plain English, you say, it's a show trial. Right? Because, of course, what is going to happen, they're going to have this trial, it's going to, it's going to drag out, they're going to bring in witnesses, all of that, and finally, it's going to be established that the Mughal emperor is guilty of treason. Right? But out of their generosity, they do not hand him the sentence of capital punishment. What do they do? They exile him to Burma, to Burma, modern day Myanmar, to Rangoon. That's what they do. You know. right? Now, the trial is very important because a trial is one of these displays of the British fidelity to the idea of law and order. Law and order. You know, that we are a regime that subscribes to the principle of law and order. You know, when, we, when, when a person has committed treason, we don't just simply kill the person, we are actually going, going to put him on trial. He's going to be allowed to defend himself, there are going to be witnesses, there's going to be an adversarial system, as there is in mod modern Anglo-American systems of law, Right? And the man is going to be able to put forward witnesses on his behalf, so forth and so on. Right? It's a military tribunal, of course. You know, so it's done under the auspices of a military commission. Um, right? And that will be officially the end of the Mughal Empire and the Mughal Emperor. All right? Now, there, there are a great many incidents, you know, some of these, the, some of the prints that have circulated here will give you an illustration, as I said, of the kinds of motifs that animated the British imagination, because this was widely reported, what was happening in India, uh, and I had indicated to you in a previous, so this is a print here, which is the capture of the King of Delhi, so you remember, I said the King of Delhi, that's Bahadur Shah Zafar over there, he is finally captured there, by, uh, by Hortz and him. In fact, by the way, a couple of his sons, he had quite a few children, uh, they're going to be actually shot dead by the British, uh, but, but Bahadur Shah Zafar himself is going to be, that's him over here, he's going to be taken captive, uh, and this is him uh, on his deathbed in, in, in Myanmar, in, in Rangoon, uh, with a hookah over there by his bedside. Um, th these are prints which are somewhat similar to their, these, this is more like a watercolor rather than one of these etched steel drawings uh, that I've been circulating over here uh, of the hand-to-hand -hand combat that took place between the sepoys and British soldiers. This is the one that you have seen already. Uh, these are rebels being, being uh, uh, hung from, uh, from the gallows. Uh, public display of this were exceedingly important because one of the things that the British were in fact attempting to do was to introduce a kind of terror, or introduce a kind of terror, right? Uh, that is you want to be able to show the power of the regime once again, all right? Uh, and this is, this is a cartoon from, from a British uh, magazine called, uh, this is not the punch, it's a, it's a different one, uh, but uh, basically the British sword of vengeance uh, justice, it says at the bottom, right? So this is uh, the figure of that this kind of retribution, it's being suggested that the British unleashed, was in fact actually deserved by the Indians. Uh, another print of the kind that you saw here where an English woman uh, is defending her honor and integrity against a rebel who is uh, intruded inside. Uh, and this one shows the siege of Lucknow. Uh, and this one is a uh, uh, this one is uh, uh, done from a contemporary drawing. Uh, I don't, th although this is this itself is not the original, but th this is a few years later, and this describes the episode that I mentioned to you, uh, of where the rebels would be tied to the cannon and then blown away. Right, so they would fire the cannon at the back. They're tied to the cannon, and then their body would fly. And this is what one Britisher uh, wrote uh, about 
about this just so that you have a visceral sense of what is happening here. The culprits were handed over to the artillerymen who ready prepared with strong ropes in their hands seized their victims. Each of these standing erect was bound, each of these standing erect was bound to a cannon and tightly secured with the small of the back covering the muzzle. And then all at once a silence which reigned around was broken by the oaths and yells of those about to die. These sounds were not uttered by men afraid of death, for they showed the most stoical indifference, but were the long suppressed utterances of dying souls who, in the bitterness of their hearts, cursed those who had been instrumental in condemning them to this shameful end. They one and all poured out maledictions on our heads, curses, and in their language, one most rich in expletives, they exhausted the whole vocabulary. Right? So this was, this was British retribution. Uh, and to cut a long story short here, because I think you get some sense of what's transpiring over here, by early mid, by early 1858, I would say by January or so, the British have largely take, taken control of the situation. And certainly by April, May of 1858, they had been able to almost entirely suppress the rebellion. Now there are going to be a few pockets of resistance here and there. Uh, a couple of the leaders, um, Nana Sahib, for example, uh, uh, are elusive. They, in fact, is never going to be found. Uh, so there are going to be a number of these, a number of the uh, most well-known leaders of the rebellion who are going to be taken into custody or killed. A couple of them are not going to be found, as I pointed out. Um, and uh, the British are going to, after the rebellion is is crushed, they are going to engage in restructuring Indian society, in restructuring Indian society. All right? And I want to give you some elements of that story. Um, uh, this is, a, by the way, the last slide I want to show you over here. Uh, this is a place called Kanpur. So these are the ghats. Uh, these are the ghats here. Uh, it's, on the, it's on the banks of the river, of course. And this is where an infamous massacre took place. Uh, where Nana Sahib, the rebel leader, had actually guaranteed protection uh, to several hundred Englishmen and English women, uh, and then, in fact, actually, once they are on the boats, uh, his troops start firing, and they wiped out uh, all the Englishers. So this became known as the infamous Kanpur massacre. Uh, and, I, and, and I'm mentioning it to you here, of course, because as I pointed out to you before, uh, there was brutality on both sides. There was brutality on both sides. Uh, there's probably more brutality on the British side, but that's simply because they have greater artillery power. I mean, the, they have the power of the state. Uh, so uh, you know, whenever you have disputes of this kind, uh, those who have the power of the state uh, generally are able to exercise much greater repression. Right? All right. So what were the what were the consequences now of the rebellion of 1857-58? All right. We want to look at some of some of those. The company uh, I've indicated to you is going to be abolished. Uh, you could say, of course, that the company had ceased to be an important player already for several decades. For several decades, officially, by the way, when I say abolished, I mean officially the company is going to exist on the books until the 1870s. But it's but it will have absolutely no say at all in the governance of India. And the official structure, structure of governance will change. Right? So, that, so that India now is transferred to the crown, meaning that India becomes a crown colony. A crown colony. And the British cabinet will have a person who will be the secretary of state for India. I want to also add here that there was another person in the British cabinet called the Secretary of State for the Colonies. But India's singularity, its overwhelming importance as the principal British colony, is indicated by the fact, of course, that there was a separate cabinet position for the person who's going to be responsible for India. Right? So, so you've, got the, you, you've got the cabinet here, the British cabinet, headed, of course, by the, the British prime minister. Okay? 
uh, the prime minister and you've got the cabinet here and one of the positions there is a secretary of state for India right this is this is a structure in England in England in India the person who had been the governor general is now going to be known as the viceroy the viceroy okay he's also going to be known as a governor general he's known by both designations uh, usually when he sits in council, he's known as a governor general in council. Uh, as a viceroy, he is not only the, not just the supreme ruler of India, but he is the representative of the British. Right? And in principle, he reports to whom? The Secretary of State. He is a supreme ruler, but this is, but India is now a crown colony, which means that it is 100% under the jurisdiction of the British Parliament now. Right? Under the jurisdiction of the British Parliament. And, and what, what is going to happen here is that the Viceroy is now going to have to report to the Secretary of State. Of course, this is, this is only so in principle in some respects, because he not only did he exercise an extraordinary amount of autonomy, but there was the same familiar problem that we had, which goes back 100 years ago, which is he's the man on the spot. He's the man on the spot. When there's a dispute that breaks out between the Viceroy and the Secretary of State, whether it's in 1860 or 1900 or 1930, uh, the Viceroy will very often tell the Secretary of State, well, you don't really know what's going on. You're far removed. You're far removed right, from what's happening in India itself. But in any case, the company is going to be abolished, India becomes a crown colony, and this becomes the governing structure. Now, secondly, I've already talked about the end of the Mughal Empire, and I've talked about his being tried on charges of treason and sedition. You know, he's convicted, exiled to Rangoon. And number three, change in administrative structures, which is related to number one and something that I've already addressed. The re-territorialization of Indian space, okay? Uh, so this is not just, you know, when I'm speaking about the desacralization of the Red Fort, I'm talking about what is now going to be the beginning of a massive attempt to restructure the urban space in India, okay? The urban space in India. And this is what, this is what I want to advert to when I speak about the utter transformation of Lucknow. Uh, or a city such as Allahabad, which is, again, in North India, quite close to Lucknow. What did the British do, fundamentally? Very simply, what they did was, they took these old Indian cities, such as Lucknow, and they raised the old city to the ground. One of the theories for doing so was that we have to ensure that there is no similar rebellion in the future. We cannot do that unless we are able to command Indian spaces. Now, you know, if you've ever been to India or if you've been to, let's say, North Africa, okay, to Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt, or you've been to these older cities, you know, you've got very narrow streets. And one of the things you cannot do in those narrow streets is, for example, you cannot take tanks. You cannot take armored cars through those streets. Okay? And the British had this theory that, ah, you know, it's in these narrow streets, in these little cafes and coffee houses and hookah bars and shops. This is where the natives are plotting a conspiracy against us. Right? So what you want to do is you want to try to eliminate that. I mean, if you've ever seen this extraordinary film, The Battle of Algiers, you know, the Kasba, right? So that was the Kasba. You know, this is when the French were, were talking about the 20th century, mid-20th century, 1950s, 60s, you know. And that was a whole idea that, you know, these, these Algerian independence fighters, you know, they're able to escape into the Kasba, into its wandering lanes, uh, and the French aren't able to locate them, you know. So, that, so one idea was you try to just eliminate this old city altogether, if you can. And certainly a great deal of Lucknow, they just simply raised to the ground. And you know, when you raise it to the ground, then what do you do? You build the new city and you have wide boulevards, 
wide boulevards. And this is something that they did in Paris, following the French Revolution, actually. Okay? All right? Yes? Oh, I'll get to that later on. I, I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, yeah, right? I'll get to that later on. I'm, I'm, I'm still on the question of the, the transformation of the urban space. The transformation of the urban space. Right? So now, and it's going to have concrete consequences on how these cities are going to look. There's a book by Vina Oldenburg called The Making of Colonial Lucknow, where she discusses in great detail how the old city was raised. And what they did effectively was when they rebuilt the city, they divided it into three parts. If you go to any city such as Delhi, Kanpur, North India especially, Delhi, Kanpur, Allahabad, three examples, okay? You'll see exactly the same thing. So these are the three cities I'm talking about. Uh, just look them up on a modern day map, you'll see, but they're all in North India. I've already shown you two of them uh, on the map. What are the three parts? So there is the native town, the native town, sometimes, by the way, in the 19th century called the black town, right? This is where the blackies, the darkies, i.e. Indians lived, okay? Then you had, so the native town, then you had what was called the civil lines, the civil lines. So this is a civil lines was, was particularly that part of the city which had been raised usually to the north, usually to the north of the city, northern portion of the city, the city that, the old city that had been raised and now rebuilt on a grid. So you have a horizontal vertical grid, none of these meandering streets with houses that are impossible to find, you know, right? So, you know, everything is kind of laid out and the British home was called the bungalow, the bungalow. Right? So the bungalow had a garden, and this is where the Britishers would live, and then they had a retinue of servants. So neatly laid out bungalows with their gardens. That's what you would find in the civil lines. The, the office of the collector of revenue, the district magistrate, the judge, all the senior British officials, right? their offices were all located in the civil lines. Adjoining that is the third area, and that's called the cantonment. And what is a cantonment? It's the military cantonment. So this is, where, this is where British officials and a regiment or two would be based. Of course, in close proximity to the civil lines, the idea being that if the civil lines ever, un, ever came under threat, you would have the military cantonment adjoining it. This is how the city was transformed. Right? Particularly, as I've said, in North India. All right? so, there is a, so, so what begins with the desacralization of the Red Fort, what is that? It's re-territorialization. That's the other language I used to describe it. Now you have re-territorialization on a massive scale where the landscape is being altered, where the city is being transformed entirely. Right? Then there was going to be the reorganization of the Indian Army. Now this was a critical factor because from the British point of view, of course, the mutiny had broke out, broken out in the ranks of the army. It had broken out in the ranks of the army. That is that there were people who were disloyal. There were soldiers who were disloyal. And you know, of course, that, that is the greatest threat to any army, any standing army anywhere in the world, whether it's in a democratic system or a totalitarian system. Uh, the idea of disloyalty is something that is not countenanced an iota, right? Uh, it's going to be severely punished. And people who are soldiers who, who manifest disloyalty are obviously going to be reprimanded and disciplined. Uh, so in order to try to avoid this, what did the British do? The first thing that they did was they said, we have to think about what kind of people are likely to be loyal to us. They essentially divided all Indians into two categories of people, the martial and the non-martial races. So the idea was that, you know, that the mutineers who had rebelled, these were people who actually belonged to their, this is being applied retrospectively now, these are people who belong to the non-martial races. 
that people who rebel are people who do not display qualities of loyalty, chivalry, masculinity, right? That's, so, you know, they, they have this theory that there are certain people who are equipped to be soldiers and others who are not, and others who are not. And we have to, we, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to change the composition of the army so that we induct into the army people who belong to the martial races, the martial races. So among the martial races, we're going to be the Sikhs. Uh, you remember that if, if I can, so if this map is not, of course, the, the best one for our purposes, but it does mention the Punjab over here. So this used to be the Sikh kingdom of Ranjit Singh. Right? And the Sikhs were a, were a people who embraced the religion which is now known as Sikhism. Right? All right? Uh, you, know, you can usually identify the Sikhs by the particular way in which men wear their turban today. Right? Uh, not all turban people in India are Sikhs, not by a long shot. Uh, but, 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 but certainly observant or orthodox Sikhs will, will wear a, men will wear a turban and they wear it in a particular way. Uh, so these Sikhs were people who had, during the rebellion, during the rebellion, if you, you notice here, it, it mentions uh, extent of British, if you look at the key here, states that are loyal, okay, states that are loyal to British with army in the rebellion, and there you see that over here, okay, this portion over here. So the British view was that the Sikhs had been loyal, these are people who display martial valor. So what is one of the practical consequences? A large number of Sikhs are going to be drawn into the army of British India. It's no longer the army of the company now. It's the army of British India. Right? It's going to be drawn. And in fact, in disproportionate numbers, because the Sikhs were supposed to be a people who were really full of martial valor. So large number of men, historically, over the decades. And in fact, this remained true until very recently. Even today, the Sikhs occupy a disproportionate place in the Indian army, but not to the extent to which they did even 20, 30 years ago, and certainly not what they did 50 years ago. Uh, because if you look at the Sikh population, it's only 2.5% of the population, but at one point, over 15% uh, of the army was made up of Sikhs. Yes? Was this voluntary, or were there sort of conscripted? No, there, there, is no, there, is no, there is no draft. There is no draft. There is no conscription here. The, these are people who are going to be encouraged, because look, if your employment prospects are limited, that is that you, know, you don't have an economy that offers prospects to people, employment prospects in many domains, the army is obviously one place. Uh, and, and as is in the case in a modern day army in a democracy, you, you ensure that people who join the army have certain kinds of benefits uh, which may not be available that easily to the general public, right? So forth and so on. So that's exactly what is, what is going to happen over here. Uh, the Sikhs are not the only martial race, of course. You know, then you have the Gurkhas. Um, uh, and in fact, the Gurkhas, uh, became a regiment in the British Army in England. Actually, you know the Gurkhas are from Nepal, uh, but you also have you also have uh, uh, some Gurkhas coming from the hill districts of Himachal, you know uh, Almora and, and so on. All right. So, in brief, there is a reorganization of the Indian Army, and the principle that is used here, the basic principle that is used here, is the principle of dividing people into martial and non-martial races and ensuring that only the martial ra races who it is who it is assumed also display the qualities that are essential right namely qualities of chivalry loyalty masculinity integrity bravery honor right and of course by the way the assumption is that the non-martial races are effete, effeminate, they're not properly masculine, uh, and if they're not properly masculine, they cannot have qualities such as chivalry, you know, right? So, and loyalty is a key factor here. Then you have the proclamation, because what, what are we doing here? We're simply saying, what is the aftermath of 1857-58? What are the consequences, right? So, what are the, do you have a proclamation by the queen 
who is actually, what does a queen do? Victoria is a queen. She's later on, much later on, she's also going to be become Empress of India. That's an official title that is going to be added um, to her roster of titles. Uh, but the proclamation very simply is this. Uh, it is issued at the advice of the British Prime Minister and the Cabinet. And the proclamation that Victoria issues in 1858 is that, look, there has been a great rebellion uh, in my territories and my Indian subjects, some of them felt disloyal for various reasons. However, I now, as the monarch, want to provide an assurance to my Indian subjects that I shall be looking out for them just as I shall be looking out for my subjects in Britain itself. That their welfare shall be predominant in my mind. That now that this is behind us, let us put this great you know, uprising, this unrest behind us. And let us try to see if we can usher in a period of peace and prosperity. And I offer my subjects the full assurance of my government's support in this endeavor. Right? That's, if you had to translate the official proclamation, that's ex pretty much what she's saying. That, you know, it's, it's happened. It was an ugly moment, you, you know, but now we need to think about how we can actually all work together for the upliftment of the Indian people. Right? So there's a proclamation that is issued by Queen Victoria. Uh, the British are no longer going to seek to expand their territory, so this notion of annexation uh, is going to become inoperative after 1858, uh, which meant that the native states that still remain there are now going to continue as native states. Right? And, so, and you're going to have pretty much the system that you had before, whereby, whereby the British are going to say that, look, we're going to leave it to the native rulers of these native states how they govern their subjects. We're going to advise them. If we find that a ruler is not sufficient to the needs of his subjects, we're going to reprimand that ruler. We're going to uh, tr publicly humiliate him if necessary. You know. But they're not going to annex the territory. They're not going to have a system of annexation now. So there's going to be a system of these, these native states. Uh, the rulers of these states will have jurisdiction over uh, such things as education of their people, you know, levels of nutrition, uh, right? What kind of systems of transportation are developed, local transportation are developed within the state, right? These are all things that are going to be under the jurisdiction of the native ruler, what you might call states' rights, all right, in the American context. Things that devolve to the states. And then there are things which obviously are going to be under the jurisdiction of the government of British India. Because a native ruler may not enter into an alliance with a foreign power, you know, right? Because if, of course, then, then, it's, then that becomes a matter of sovereignty, right? So it, an attempt for, at consolidation. Um, and of course, if we continue down, and we're going to look at the last two as well, but just think of it for a moment that if we continued in this vein, we're going to find that as we move, I'm talking about the immediate aftermath. Because when you move into the 1860s, 70s, 80s, we're going to find that obviously uh, the British are intro going to introduce a great many other measures of social reform as well. But one of the things that's going to happen immediately, 1857, 1858, expansion of Indian higher education. So this is an attempt to answer that the criticism of Sir Saeed Ahmed Khan, if I may put it this way, namely that Indians do not have a place in the governance of their own country. And of course, how can they if they don't have access to higher education? So several universities are going to be founded in 1857. University of Madras. University of Delhi is going to be much later on, but University of Madras, University of Allahabad are going to be founded in 1857 itself. So what you're going to begin to see is an expansion of Indian higher education. And the last thing I want to mention to you here, uh, telegraphs, posts, and railways. Here I've only mentioned the expansion of the railway network. All three are important. The telegraph line was established in 1851. This became very important, by the way, in the suppression of the rebellion. 
because, if, because the British could telegraph, you know, a rebellion is taking place in one part of the country, 500 kilometers away, you need a bunch of troops because of an outburst there. Well, you use the telegraph to communicate the information, right? Telegraphs, railways. The first railway lines introduced in the early 1850s, early 1850s. It's going to become a massive network, a massive network, the Indian railway system. All right? It was so massive, in fact, already that, and as a little footnote I'll add, I'll stop there and then I'll take up the narrative with the railways and move on to the economy in my next lecture. But just to give you an idea, until last year, okay, in fact, it would be very early this year, the railway budget was always separate from the national budget of the country. Right? The railways was going to become the largest employer in India, the largest employer. Its beginnings, however, are in the early 1850s. Right? And when it becomes, when it expands, of course, it becomes a source of as I said, employment eventually as well. But what the railways are also going to do, and that's why it's a good segue into the question of the economy and concluding remark, they are going to be the first time that British capital really is going to come directly into India. Because when they start the railways, it's going to be British investors, almost exclusively British investors, who are promised a return of 5% on their investment. Okay, in a few cases it was a little bit less than that, about 4.5%, but they promised a return of 5%. Uh, and this is going to be the beginning of the railway system. All right, so we stop over here.